Vielen Dank. Ähm, danke, dass ich da sein darf. Ähm, normalerweise spreche ich in viel kleineren Kontexten, wenn wir so eine Ostwissenschaften haben. Da sitzen zehn Leute im Raum, vielleicht mal zwölf. Das ist auch heute toll, dass so viele da sind. Ähm, es wird ganz viel um Arabisch gehen. Ich bitte um Nachsicht diesbezüglich. Um, and after some consideration, I switch into English as we want to have some clearance within that panel. Um, you can find the slides online. Is, is there are quite a few links that you can follow um, under that link that is both at the bottom of every slide and on the front slide. And now let me check whether this works here. Um, does it? Yes, okay. So it has a three part structure. I will present the background of my research and the today's research question, introduce the method and the corpora that I'm working with, and then talking about the results of my research. Um, I also have to say it's sort of preliminary research that was intended uh, for a uh, Marie Curie fellowship that is not going to happen with a new job. So take it with a grain of salt. I wanted to explore these um, themes and topics further and we we'll see how that works out in the future. It's very preliminary findings at the moment. Um, so the background are, yes, it works, Arabic periodicals, They're quite interesting. They're the first mass medium in the Arabic speaking world, by and large, the Eastern Mediterranean to speak of, um, starting in the late 18th century, um, and then being the central medium for all the various discussions that still reverberate around the world, in particular within the Islamic hate world, such as the uh, literary and cultural Arabic Renaissance, the Nahda, um, Islamism, Salafi, uh, etc. Um, and it's a central forum for, negotiate, for negotiating these various processes and ideas of modernity. Um, and thus periodicals have been quite important in the historiography of the, reason, of the region, but unfortunately only as a source and not as a subject in themselves, which leads um, to a variety of um, nationalist narratives. You know that the Ottoman Empire disintegrated after World War I. We have these successor states, new nationalist movements, and they all need some explanatory narrative for them coming into being. Um, and thus the, the history of the periodical press is very much intended by these nationalist discourses on um, these successor states of the Ottoman empires. Um, and within research, we have a bias on mainly two places, Cairo and Beirut, and a rather small number of titles, which is predominantly due to these titles being present in the library scholars had access to, right? And the reason why they are available is oftentimes that publishers donated them to these libraries very consciously. Um, so there's some agency involved in this process. Um, and it's also governed by an implicit hypothesis, which I will talk about today. Um, and just to give you a brief idea how they look, um, these are two different genres. It's journals or magazines and newspapers. Newspapers are on the right. Um, the interesting bit is um, that newspapers show a remarkable consistency across temporal and geographic spaces, because in the middle you see a periodical from a newspaper published in Beirut, and to the right you see a newspaper published in New York City. Um, and they both literally look the same, right? Interestingly, particularly that you have um, the Tora of the Ottoman Sultan in the American example. Um, nevertheless, I will talk about journals today for reasons of um, available data sets. Um, so basically, my research interest is in the intellectual networks, um, and I want to empirically test um, hypotheses and evaluate the existing literature on these periodicals. And um, what I'm interested in is what are the important authors in this new public sphere? Importance being, you know, publishing in various um, journals across these vast geographic expanse that also spans uh, the new world, right? Um, and interestingly, these were preliminary results is um, that we have um, surprising members of these networks that reject a, a vast amount of literature because there's a huge number of, of um, Iraqis in there, as opposed to the common notion that it is dominated by Syrians. There are only very few Christians. Again, the narrative is it's mostly exiled Lebanese Christians moving both into uh, Latin America and into Egypt. And based on the sample that is available to us, and I talk about that sample, we already see this cannot be upheld by the empirical data at hand. Um, but there's a problem with intellectual networks. It only maps a very small portion of the actual network due to the data bias available to us, namely that four-fifths of all articles in the periodical press carry no byline. We don't know who authored these articles. And the question is, who did? 
And there's also implicit hypothesis in the literature that says, oh, it's all the editors and publishers printed onto the masthead. They just ordered it by themselves. Problem being, of course, it's a vast amount of text. How was that practically possible? And we know that quite a few of these publishers were absent from the place of publication. At the time of a publication, how did they author, like let's say 64 pages every month while not being there? So the question is, who did? And um, my suggestion is, yay, stylometric authorship attribution to the rescue. Um, and the question is, what is stylometric authorship attribution? Basically, um, it's a very simple idea. It says that the authorship signal is prevalent in the most frequently used words, i.e. function words, because you cannot consciously influence them. Thus, your auctorial voice is present, even though you try to hide it or one might try to hide it. Um, importantly, it's a comparative method. Um, you first of all compute frequency, word frequencies or token frequencies for every text. Then you compare these frequency lists to each other, and then you compute uh, difference measures. Um, and if you do that over different iterations of most frequent words, you can have an auto-voting um, consensus um, in the process as well. There are, of course, a number of challenges. First of all, um, Arabic. It's not very largely supported in digital infrastructures. Um, then the issue that, as a comparative method, it depends on input. Authors that are not in your data set cannot possibly be found, right? goes without saying. Um, and finally, reliability has been shown to depend on a minimal length. And here is an issue with periodical texts, they tend to be really short. And now the question is, what is the absolute minimal length to get away with um, in order to run stylometric authorship attribution on periodicals? Um, and basically, um, these are the settings we have come up with. Uh, we use um, the stylo package for R by Machi Eda et al. Um, and we did run um, parameter testing together with Maxim Romanov, nowadays a leading Emunita group at the University of Hamburg. Um, and what we established, I can, I can give you a brief, um, sorry, overview, which would probably have been in different um, order here, is um, we presented that at the DH 2022 in Tokyo. Um, and it's based on a corpus of 300 books by 28 authors from the late 19th, early 20th century. And we try to run basically every possible combination of every parameter in this dialog package and then test them and plot them and compare them visually. Um, as you can see, it demanded quite some computational omph. And we thank the guitar project of Sarah Savant at the Arahan University for lending us their server to run that on, as we had like more than two weeks of computing time of 20 to 30 cores. Um, and these were then plotted into these um, plots where you can see over these various iterations of parameters, a convert, very quick conversions of identifying authors and a much lower um, exactitude in, auth in identifying individual works. But basically everything between 2,500 tokens, these are single word tokens, um, is pretty good. To, you get to a high 90%, like 90 percentages in the upper, I'm sorry, upper range of the 90s. Um, so the settings we chose for the, for the work that I'm presenting today is we have a sampling of a minimum length of 2,500 words. Uh, we use most frequent features of 200 to 500 tokens that we increment by 100. We have zero culling and we use either simple delta as a distance measure. Um, it has the advantage to be computationally relatively simply and does not require that much computational power. Um, so what is the corpus that I'm working with? Uh, it's based on a, an editing project that I was running while in Beirut, which aims at um, combining manual transcriptions from Arabic shadow libraries with facsimiles from usually um, academic scanning initiatives in order to validate the transcription against the facsimile. Problem behind that is, of course, that optical character recognition for Arabic had been unsolved at that point in time. With the advent of machine learning, this is changing, but this was what was available in the mid 2010s. Um, and the corpus uh, consists at the moment of four um, periodicals largely published in the early 20th century. Um, we omitted a fifth periodical because it was published much earlier, and thus the argument would be the, auth the authors from Al Ostad published in Cairo are very unlikely to have published 30 years later in other periodicals. Um, so it's a rather small uh, corpus. Um, problem, of course, being the average length of articles being in the 600s, 700s, 800s. 
Um, and interestingly, um, the, the largest section of that corpus, which is the journal Al Muqtabas, published by Muhammad Qutb Ali in Cairo and later Damascus, um, has a very, very low number of articles with um, explicitly mentioned authorship information. So we have a huge corpus of anonymous texts. Um, from the data, it's, oh, it's modeled in TIXML, so issues have been uh, segmented into sections and articles and explicit bylines have been marked up. Some named entity recognition has, run, has been run on that and then um, and the disambiguation uh, with uh, um, authority files. At the end of the day, we have um, two data sets that I'm going to talk about today. One is um, about 300 individual articles, um, which is a large number of articles of a large number of authors, so a very small number of texts per author, compared to an almost equal or even larger number of anonymous um, articles. And the second data set in order to get beyond that threshold of the minimal required length is to combine all unattributed texts within sections, that is um, news, reviews, yada yada, into a single file per issue, and then compare that to known authors in order to establish whether certain authors could have been an editor of an issue, right? Um, so results. This hurrah, a spaghetti monster, as you all know, uh, plotting networks can get confusing pretty quickly, particularly if you have a large number of um, authors involved as nodes. Over here you see the, the text of the nodes and the difference measures uh, establishes the weight of the edges between the nodes. Um, and, but the good news is it does work, nevertheless. And I will look into details and in parts of the network to try to convince you it does work. Um, and first of all, um, and unfortunately my speaker notes don't show the full picture, so I actually have to turn over there and have a look at, at that slide. Um, gives you, and I all, always plotted like these radar plots for behaving the most related um, nodes together and then see whether it makes sense or not through a close reading of the bibliographic information at hand. Um, and basically it's first argument being that um, text clustered together by genre. So we have um, some, info, some text on geographic and travelogues. Um, some of them are uh, carry explicit authorship information, in this case, Kadim al who has been the editor of one of the journals in that sample, namely Lurat al-Arab from Baghdad. Um, and it, thus it is highly likely that he is actually the author of this unattributed text number 20 in that plot behind me. Um, it makes complete sense. He authored a large number of travelogues. These seem to be stylistically similar. Thus we can safely assume, yes, indeed, he did author that particular text, and he also happens to be the editor of the journal the text was published in. So it seems to confirm tentatively the hypothesis, right? Um, but there are dead authors in there, quite a lot of them. Uh, Ibn al Muqaffa, who died in the eighth century, uh, he certainly did not author any text in the journals. But interestingly, of course, there is this um, fashion of editing old texts at the time by younger, particularly Islamists. Uh, who tried to establish the tradition they wanted to follow. And thus, um, we have Tahir al-Jazairi, who's a very well-known um, son of Abdul Qadar al-Jazairi, who played a large role in saving Christians uh, in the 1860 massacres in Damascus. And he's editing uh, a lot of these classic texts. And the question here is, do we actually see a signal of Ibn al-Muqaffa, or do we see the signal of Tahir al-Jazairi's editing? Um, I have no idea, to be honest but they tend to cluster together. So at least there is a signal there, parts of it being authorship, parts of it being editorship. Um, another issue uh, is William Shakespeare. Surprising author in that sample, right? And um, apparently language is very different, even though of course it's translated into Arabic. So it's first of all, it should have been the signal of the translator and not so much the author, given the argument behind cinematic uh, authorship attribution being about the function words. Um, nevertheless, um, this clustering is compared by close reading because um, apparently these human transcribers made typos by transcribing, they weren't aware that Julius Caesar is actually Julius Caesar. So they write bulus, uh, which is polis. And then you see, okay, it's simple Arabic typo. 
And it's so basically the stylometric authorship attribution is confirmed by the actual metadata if it is corrected against the facsimile. Um, then it is helpful apparently for resolving acronyms. Some bylines do not carry full names, but only the first name of the, sorry, the first letter of the first name of the author. And of course that's difficult to establish. Yet in this case, there is a strong argument to be made that um, in, it's the author labeled 460 in the plot to the left. It's like it's turquoise dots. Um, Shukri al-Asali, who is a member of parliament in the first um, post Young Turk revolutionary parliament in Istanbul and an avid uh, journalist and intellectual from Damascus. And also one of the co-editors of Muhammad Qad Ali in one of his newspapers. So there might be an argument that Shukri al-Asali is indeed an editor also of the journal al Muqtabas. Um, but in this case, uh, stylometric authorship helps us to establish that a guy who, author, who bylined with the sheen, which is the first letter of Shukri, uh, is actually Shukri al-Asali in this sample. So this, again, confirms certain guesses made from the bibliographic metadata. Um, and finally, um, again, back to the issue of um, translators and the voice of the translator, um, we have large sections of a very popular work of Charles de Nobos, um, the, the, the general history being translated into Arabic by Muhammad Qad Ali. And um, these cluster together both with Charles de Nobos and Muhammad Qad Ali. So again, we see, as, as in the case of Ibn al-Muqaffa, we have the same sort of signal of the translator come editor being apparent in the text of the translated works. Um, and... Sorry, oh no. So finally, to the main question actually, can, should we consider owners come editors as the authors of the anonymous texts? And as I said, we use the data set of anonymous articles gathered in, from each issue, compiled together, and then running the sampling on this new um, sort of synthetic text. And um, the first result probably would be in the case of al muqtabas no, not at all. Muhammad Qur Ali is very unlikely to have authored um, the anonymous works um, in his own journal, as you can see from this network plot, where Muhammad Qad Ali is only the blue dots, to be honest, because we have only very limited um, um, attributed works by him in the sample, but they're clearly distinct from this large mass of gray stuff. And I have thrown in additional control authors, which, have, which are clearly known to not have authored al Muqtabas to see how they work and to see where that things clustered and whether that pushes Muhammad Qad Ali further into his own journal, because that would be the argument, right? If you put in a German author, the distance to the German author by the nature of it using a different language would be so large that everything else clusters together. Um, but there's also an argument if we use uh, community detection algorithms for different editors being at work here, right? Um, looking at the other journal in our sample, we see um, the picture becoming more, um, more nuanced, so to say, because um, this is the journal Lorat al-Arab, mostly philological journal from Baghdad, published by uh, Anastas Mari al karmeli a, a Carmelite monk, and uh, one of his disciples, Kazim al And here you see, and they are plotted in red and green on that plot, they are actually quite close to the works in their own journal. So I guess it's more likely that they were actually the, edit the authors of the anonymous text in their journal, or at least much more likely than Muhammad Qad Ali was for his own journal. Um, and again, we see a clustering by community detection algorithms that speak for multiple different editors. Um, and I'm not sure about the time, Torsten. Two minutes, that's fantastic. Because um, basically that's very, just a brief idea that I wanted to vent. Um, whether we can speak of a actorial voice for individual periodicals. Um, and thus, I just threw in everything we had and see how it fares. Um, you know, the sort of making approach of let's try it out and see what happens. Um, and first of all, you see, yes, indeed, there seems to be something like an actorial voice for periodicals. They seem to speak with different voices. There is also some clustering going on, which is quite interesting between uh, al muqtabas and Azuhur, one being published in Damascus, one being published in Cairo. Uh, one would need to establish whether it's mostly a thematic uh, similarity, but again, the stylometric argument speaks against that. Um, there might be collaboration going on, there might be movement of people, um, et cetera, et cetera, something to be explored further. Um, 
and I'm not torturing with the PCA analysis, only to say that um, in this sample, it's quite interesting because it's, it shows you sort of difference over time, which is of major concern for historians, I suppose, um, that some issues of al Muqtabas cluster to the right, right topmost corner, and it seemed to be stylistically very different from all the other issues of the same journal, and much more different from that same journal, sorry, from other journals than from its own sort of surrounding, which speaks for a change in editorship at a certain point in time, potentially. Um, again, something to be explored further with closed reading. And thus, I want to come to an end and thank you all, and particularly thank to all the collaborators in the project, because of course, it's a lot of manual work. Um, first of all, Maxim Romanov for his parameter testing and all the lovely student collaborators from various internships at the Orient Institute who worked on correcting and um, the TI XML editions. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the question and discussion.